Welcome and a quick introduction to our guest today. This is a Lick Wilmerding alum from the class of 1992. Um, also, San Francisco Board of Supervisor for District 8 and running tomorrow also for District 8, Rafael Mandelman. So we're very lucky to have him here today with us the day before election. I'm just going to give you a little um, preview introduction and then I'm going to turn the microphone over to Rafael. Um, I do want to let you all know that there's going to also be some time for some interaction and for some Q&A. So if there are particular questions that you have about um, local politics, um, about elections in general, or sort of pathways to politics, there'll be some time um, to engage and to be able to ask some of those questions. So, Rafael, as you might have guessed, grew up in San Francisco, attended Brandeis Hillel Day School, and then Lake Wilmerding High School, and then moved on from Lake Wilmerding to Yale. Oh, Development, and then would return the, uh, over summers to teach um, at-risk youth in San Francisco to middle school students. Um, he received a master's degree in public policy from Harvard and a law degree from UC Berkeley. Um, so, um, as a District 8 resident for the past two decades, Rafael has been a strong ad advocate for District 8 neighborhoods. Um, serving as president of the Noe Valley Democratic Club, commissioner on the San Francisco Board of Appeals, chair of the San Francisco LGBT Center, and president of the District 8 Democratic Club. As an urban development attorney, he has helped build thousands of affordable housing units all over the Bay Area. He sweats the details, doing what it takes to make affordable housing and livable communities a reality. In addition, he ran for the City College, our neighbor, board of trustees in 2012, he became president of that board and was widely acknowledged for steering an 80-year institution through its recent accreditation crisis. Rafael is a strong advocate for students. He's praised for his cool head and not being afraid to make hard calls to save City College. And his leadership endured that City would weather the crisis and implement new programs, central programs as far as I'm concerned for the City, which is free City College. So we'd like to welcome Rafael. Do your best to give him a hearty and love and love. So nice. Thank you, Kate. And you're going to keep the mic because I want this to be interactive if we can, and I'll talk a little bit, and you guys can talk a little bit. Um, any Brandeis grads? Yeah, Brandeis! Any, any District 8 residents? Yeah, District 8! Um, well, it is. It is. Uh, it is. Amazing to be back here. I actually did something a little bit like this 10 years ago when it had only been about 20 years since I graduated from Lake Wilmerding. Um, and now, 30 years later, I'm back and I'm so happy that Elliot Smith is still here. Give it up for Elliot Smith. Um, it, it's reassuring that, you know, as much as this as this campus has changed, that there are still some things that have stayed the same. Um, and so we're all lucky for that. So I don't know if any of you have this experience, sort of the Sunday afternoon, the weekend is kind of drawing to a close, and you have to do something on Monday, and you're not entirely sure about it. There's a test or a paper you have to turn in, and you're just not entirely sure how you're going to get there. So I had a little bit of that panic attack kind of revisiting my high school experience yesterday as I was thinking about talking to you all today. Um, but it was worse because I feel this obligation to give you timeless wisdom to guide you through the next 30 years, um, which is a lot. So, um, but I did, you know, it was a, a great opportunity to think a little bit about where we are politically now, um, how that is, how that is different from where we were in 1988. Um, and I also realized sort of this morning as I was listening to NPR that I don't, I'm not sure I have so much timeless wisdom to give you because I think you already have a lot of timeless wisdom. Is Harry Bernholtz Bernholt around? Where's Harry? Hey Harry, you did great on the radio this morning. 
Um, and, and, um, and I am continually impressed by the activism of the Gilberting students already. So I think you kind of already have it. And, And then I walked in the door today, and I saw the Yes on C sign, and I realized there were, uh, there's apparently been a group here working on Yes on C stuff, which I think is very cool. We can talk about, we will talk about homelessness a little bit later. Um, how many of you are voting for the first time this election? That's awesome. That's great. And how many of you would describe yourselves as political people? Okay. I, I think um, I'll be interesting to uh, interested to hear maybe from you all what um, after we're after I'm done maybe uh, for those of you who think of yourselves as political people why and for those of you who don't think of yourselves as political people maybe why not. Um, how, uh, let's see, what was my next, what was my next thought? Oh, I'm also curious, just to get a sense of the, um, kind of your self-concept and your ideas about politics here at Lick. When I was here, honestly, most of us were pretty liberal, and I have a feeling it's probably somewhat similar, or there may be people in the, in the room who are murmuring because they're not liberal, they're further left, but I'm, Curious, um, you know. I'm going to give you five options. Um, you know, very liberal or something left of that. Liberal, moderate, conservative, or very conservative or right of that. And of course, nobody has to play this game. This is entirely, you know, up to you. But I am curious. Who here thinks that they are very liberal or something left of that? There's some good representation there. Who all thinks they might be liberals? They're liberal, but not, you know, all the time. That's a lot. That's good. That's probably a lot like San Francisco. Or, and then, uh, who thinks themselves as moderate? You know, take things as they come, issue by issue. Might okay, and a little, a few folks. Okay, now I know is the part where we have to get really brave. Who, are there folks here who are willing to say that they think they might be conservative? I actually, it's really good for you if there are some here. Um, and are, is anyone here willing to like fess up and say, you know, honestly, I love y'all, but I'm actually very conservative? Okay, so there might be some very conservative people here who don't actually feel comfortable expressing that right right now. And, and I do think it's useful in our little in our little San Francisco. So I mean I have to fess up and say, you know, I'm pretty liberal. So I'm somewhere probably in that spectrum between liberal and very liberal. Um, but a couple of thoughts about that. One is you don't always stay in the same place through your whole life. And I would say that when I was at Lick, I was probably maybe a little more moderate or even conservative um, when I was here. Now again, that's like San Francisco standards where everything is, you know, worked by our San Francisco sensibility. But, you know, I was like a big, like, great books, Western Civ kind of guy. And I was more of a Democrat than not, but I just, you know, wasn't always sure that um, the most communist place in the room was the, was the best place to be. Um, and so, I, you know, for those of you who feel that way, like, you know, that might have been me when I was here. Um, the other thing I think for everyone here, you know, your admissions office does a ton of work to create this perfect little body of folks who represent all different kinds of backgrounds and perspectives. And it's a tough thing to have the kind of conversations you really want to have. Um, if, you know, if you don't have ideological diversity. And so, um, I think as you, some of this is going to get fixed when you all go off to college and you realize, this is the rest of the world. And that was very much my experience. I think one of the things that moved me from feeling like I might be in the center to making me feel much more um, like a liberal or a progressive or something 
left is, confront, is meeting people from the rest of the country whose perspectives are totally different. 42% of the people in this country right now think Donald Trump is just fine. And they're not all jerks. So there is value in kind of trying to understand and have the conversations which you will inevitably have with folks who have views who are very, very different from yours. Um, and I think one of the things for me as a, poli as a politician, uh, and good politicians, notwithstanding this moment, spend I think as much time listening as talking, is you it's good to try and hear from other people with like widely different perspectives why they have those different views. And so I just want to encourage everybody here, although I, I love, I mean, oh, I love this, um, and I think it's right. But, um, but as you have opportunities over the next years, I hope you'll reach out and have conversations with people who think very, very differently from you. And you know, I know that Wilmer is, tr is training you to be able to have those conversations in respectful, good ways where everybody comes out better for it. Um, how many of you feel uh, like you really care what happens tomorrow in the elections? I like that. That's that's pretty great. This is, you know, the the, the news has been that um, that you know, of course, young people get a bad rap for not voting. Um, I think Harry was saying, like, do you really want your grandparents deciding, like? doing all the voting for all of us, like that, that's not so great. Um, but there has been a trend in this election, more young people are participating, and I think that's a really great thing. Um, how many of you, so we talked about who, who, uh, who voted, how many of you have volunteered in some way for this election? That's great, give yourself a hand. So for those of you who volunteered, how many of you were volunteering on like a, con a congressional election or something affecting national politics? And how, and how many of you were volunteering on like a ballot proposition or like a supervisor election, something local? More participation there. I believe as a local elected official um, that you're, of course, what happens nationally is incredibly important, but your ability to impact your community and sort of immediately what happens in your world is often much more at the local level. And so I want to encourage, you know, commend those of you who have already stepped in and engaged and are doing uh, something politically locally and encourage all of you who might be interested to do that um, in a career in public service, working in government in some way, district attorney, public defender, Social policy, homelessness, social work. Okay, so a few. And and how many of you think you might be interested in running for something at some point? All right. I mean, we need like Wilmer and graduates running for office. The world is not going to get fixed if they do not. So. For those of you who are going to, thank you. And, and for the rest of you, think about it. Um, when I have conversations with people who are dramatically younger than me and try to think about, you know, um, timeless wisdom to share, um, I think about how the world is different now from, it was, from how it was when I was in their place. So, um, how many of you know Laurelyn Bergstedt? Everybody? So, Laurelyn and I, where is Laurelyn? There you are. Laurelyn and I met in the fall of 1988. Uh, we were, uh, we were, there was a, this campus totally blows my mind because it destroys all of my childhood memories. I can't find my way around. I, 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 Elliot Smith is awesome, but PE honestly was not my favorite, like, activity when I was in high school. And, um, so it's sort of, like, bittersweet that the thing that's remaining is the gym. <laughs> 
but, um, but the whole rest, of the, the whole, much of the rest of the campus has changed. Well, Arlen and I met in what was a cafeteria um, down at the other end of the other end of the school for uh, freshman orient frosh, frosh orientation. And when we started in the fall of 1988, uh, Ronald Reagan was the president of the United States. Um, there was an election happening, and I was very excited about a guy named Mike Dukakis. Has anyone heard about Michael Dukakis? Yeah, you gotta be a real politics nerd to know who Michael Dukakis was, but he was running against a guy named George H.W. George Bush to be President of the United States. And, and at the time, you know, after George H.W. Bush won, I was so depressed because I couldn't imagine that someone that bad could be President of the United States. <laughs> Now, of course, and that my fellow country people could possibly think that this guy from Texas with these values that I thought were pretty wrong was a better choice than this liberal guy from Massachusetts who seemed basically to see the world, you know, more or less similarly to the way I did. Um, so that was a disappointment. That was, you know, one of the first uh, elections that I paid close, close attention to. Um, and that, that was a disappointing uh, election. There have been a lot since then. Um, George H.W. Bush's son beat Al Gore in 2000. That was the end of the world. That was going to be. That was terrible, and it was rough. And then in 2004, we were uh, we were in uh, you know a war. Uh, George uh, W. Bush had gotten us into this horrible war in Iraq that wasn't going anywhere. Had passed these crazy tax cuts that were destroying the country, and it seemed obvious to me that my fellow Americans would realize that he needed to be thrown out, and that John Kerry, who was a war hero, and again, saw the world pretty much the way I did, um, was the much, much better choice to be president. And then, somehow, George W. Bush got himself reelected. Um, and it was not until 2008 uh, that I actually, well, uh, 1992 was another year that you know was good from my perspective, but, uh, but 2008, the Obama year, extraordinary. But, but, you know, this goes back to my point about trying to understand the perspective of people who disagree with you. Um, because both Bill Clinton and Barack Obama were able to communicate with portions of this country that much of the time vote in ways differently from the way we San Franciscans do. Um, and when, when people who we in San Francisco are supporting fail to do that, because they're not having those conversations in a good enough way with the rest of the country, we get moments like we have now, which I think um, many of us would feel is politically a pretty bad moment. Um, so 1988, Mike Dukakis, the Berlin Wall. Anyone know what the Berlin Wall was? Yeah, it's history, but but when Marlon and I started, it was, that was the thing. There was a Berlin Wall. It was up. It was intact. Communism was happening. Um, the mayor of San Francisco was a guy named Art Agnos, and and there was a problem in San Francisco, a growing problem in San Francisco called homelessness. You, you, you might have heard of it. But in 1988, it was actually relatively new. Um, it was like a few people with shopping carts um, that you might see. And it was troubling to people to see this scattering of folks who didn't seem to have a home. And in fact, um, in a, about a year late, I think it was a year or two into my time at high school, in high school, um, there was actually an encampment of homeless folks that grew up in San Francisco. It was the first major encampment that I remember happening in San Francisco, and that encampment happened down in the Civic Center. It was so horrifying that it was, a, to San Franciscans, it was a big part of our diagnosis got not getting reelected uh, for mayor in 1991. Um, the Giants were still playing in Candlestick Park. There was no Pac Bell Park. Uh, San Francisco was five years into the AIDS crisis. 
And, and at the time, AIDS was a death sentence. Um, and we actually had a teacher here at Lick while I was around um, who died of AIDS. It was the first person I had known um, who died of AIDS. And I remember at the, uh, after the funeral at a reception, um, there was a guy with this big, giant phone thingy. But it was not connected to a, to a wire. It was just this giant phone he was able to use um, that was, uh, again, disconnected. That was like an early cell phone. And for some reason, I remember that those two things are, are associated in my brain. A very early cell phone and, uh, and, and the height of the AIDS crisis. Um, the world has changed. Um, oh, have folks heard about the hole in the ozone layer? Yeah, you're good, you're good. You're, but in the 80s, the hole in the ozone layer was like the environmental challenge of our time. We had to figure out how to heal this hole in the ozone layer. And what, do you, what would you say is the environmental challenge of our time today? Cacophony, so many environmental challenges. It might be global warming, greenhouse gases, that, that was not really a thing, uh, or if it was a thing, it was not a, a widely known thing. As I was starting, starting high school, folks were starting to talk about it, but people didn't quite understand the impacts it was going to have. Has anyone here used a payphone? Well, when Laurelyn and I started high school, there were payphones everywhere, and again, only this guy who I saw with this giant, giant cell phone. Uh, had a cell phone. And cell phones did not exist. There were there were payphones everywhere, and there was no Facebook. There was no Instagram. There was no Google. Uh, there were no internets, at least that most people were using. So it was quite a different world, and. And I'm telling you that um, and trying to give you a sense of how different the world is today from the world that confronted us or that we were living in 30 years ago because you are going to go through similar or greater changes in the world over your next 30 years. Um, and you don't know what they're going to be like, but it's going to go by in the blink of an eye. And I think, you know, the couple of, I don't know if this is timeless wisdom, but um, one of my teachers here was an English teacher named Anne Maisel. Uh, what? She's just a cafe. I didn't know she was an actual person. Um, well, she was. She was a fantastic English teacher. I think she also became dean of students at some point. Um, but, uh, but she was this great English teacher and, and I, was, I really loved her. And I remember she was one of the first adults who clued me into the fact that time gets faster as you get older. And you may already have figured this out, but that you will be stunned. Some of you might even remember hearing from this middle-aged politician back in 2018, how quickly it goes by. The distance between you and 30 years from now looks infinitely longer when you are looking forward than when you get, than when you get 30 years later and look back. And the little things that I would urge from you, urge, urge for you to do during that, you know, during that time as it is racing by without you really being aware that it's racing by, is try to take time to see it going by, to live your life fully, and to engage with it. Because it really is very, very precious. Um, and you will do amazing things and see amazing things. And I want you to pay attention. Um, I think part of making the most of that 30 years is to try to be of service. And I think, you know, 
Lick Wilmerding has drummed that into your brains on a regular basis. That uh, this is a private school with public purpose. Anyone heard that? Yes. Yes, Supervisor Mandelman. They have told us this. You know. Um, but you have, you know, you have been given an extraordinary opportunity to have these four years in this amazing place. And it sets all of you up with opportunities that other people do not have. You know all this. Um, but there is an obligation, I think, to pay it forward. Um, for me, I felt like that obligation was even greater because when I arrived at Lake Wilmerding uh, in that fall of 1988, my family situation was kind of a mess. Um, I was kind of living with my grandmother. I was also sort of had been living with families at Brandeis that had taken me in because my parents weren't able to take care of me and they were kind of a mess. And while I was at Lick, I actually ended up living with an English teacher here um, named Eleanor Burke. Uh, and her husband, I lived with them for three years. My junior year, who, juniors, are you sufficiently stressed out about college? Yes, you're very stressed out. And the seniors are saying you're not supposed to. Well, when I was a junior, I was pretty, I was uh, pretty stressed out. But one of the things that Lick Wilberding did for me then. In addition to telling me that I wasn't supposed to be stressed out, which I'm sure Lick Wilberty has been telling juniors ever since, um, was that my teachers took up a little collection to send me on my East Coast college tour. And so I was able to go to Yale because of what, because of what Lick had done for me. So I'm a big fan of this institution, and obviously, as well, a big fan of paying it forward. So, um, after Lit, I went on to Yale. More timeless wisdom for you all. I know, you, and this is again sort of from my perspective of 30 years later, looking back, old man. Um, get a liberal arts education. Spend, I, I know it feels like you want to be in a hurry and you want to get busy doing something, but use that time in college to explore lots of different kinds of things, science and literature and humanities. It was really valuable for me to take that time. It has not set me back in, you know, my plans for my life, but it was really valuable to spend that time and read those books and learn about myself. I actually needed to spend some time in college coming out as well. Um, I, you know, been in San Francisco, gayest city in the world, and that was not, for me, the time when I was going to come out. But I did that in college, and I did a lot of other things, and found and explored history, and, and, and things that have proved useful to me, even though they aren't directly related to what I'm doing professionally in my life. So I want to encourage folks to think about taking time in college, and taking time after college. I did not. I went straight through to get those graduate degrees, and I do think that there would have been some value in, in exploring some different careers. So although I'm telling you that 30 years is going to go really, really quickly, um, make the most of it, and part of, it is, part of making the most of it is giving yourself the time to explore some different paths. Um, service has been important to me. I think uh, Kate talked a little bit about my biography. But the things that have been most useful to me during that time have been my failures. And, you know, sort of another piece of timeless wisdom you've already heard, but you don't learn from your successes. When you get A's on every single paper, you don't get better. I ran for supervisor in, in 2010, and I lost. And I lost against a guy named Scott Weiner, who's now a state senator. Um, but I grew from seeing someone who at the time was a much better politician than me, who was doing it better than me, and I learned from watching him for that year that I was running against him, and I never got good enough to beat him, but I got, better, but I got good enough to run for the college board two years later and win that race. And I got good enough, or continued to develop, become a better public servant, and 
this year, uh, when there was an opening for that District 8 spot again, I was able to run, and doing a lot of the same things that I'd seen Scott Wiener do eight years earlier, I was able to win. So I do want to encourage folks to, of course you don't want to try to fail, like failing is not something to seek, but when you do, it might be better than what would have happened for you if you had, if you had won at every single thing you do. Um, so today, I'm you know, four months into being a supervisor in San Francisco, which is the coolest job in the world. Um, I get to try to solve every problem of every one of my constituents on a daily basis. It's amazing. In, in San Francisco, um, most people feel like their relationship to government is a direct one. Now that we, we used to not have district elections before 2000. You may not know this, we, we had citywide elections. But since we've had district elections, many people feel like if they have a problem with anything remotely related to government, the person to go to is their district supervisor. And that's very cool, because you learn about everything. And another thing with Walmart and gave me was you know, a lot of curiosity about the world. So that is um, great. And then we have these incredible local challenges that I get to try to work on. Um, Prop C, <laughs> vote for Prop C. Um, we can talk, if you're interested, about homelessness and mental health and drug addiction, but it does seem to me like it is the main problem in San Francisco right now and the main challenge for city government, and it's something I get to work on trying to solve every single day. Another thing you get to do as a, as a politician um, is you know, try to lift up uh, your community, which is really, really, uh, has been a challenge in this age of Trump. Um, I do think, so there was a, there's a, there's a Greek, an ancient Greek idea, back to my liberal arts education, that the quality of, of your government impacts the quality of the people who are in it, and vice versa. So our characters impact our government, and our government impacts our character. And if we have a government that has bad character, that's a real challenge. If you are a local elected official um, in, in a government that, is, uh, that has bad character, um, it's, it, it creates very, very interesting challenges in trying to like, you know, lead. So another thing we can talk about, although I see I'm running a little bit out of time. Um, I want to leave you with a couple thoughts. Um, in thinking about sort of the challenge of this particular moment with this uh, particular president and what's going to happen tomorrow, um, again, we don't know what the future holds. I didn't know 30 years ago necessarily where I would be going. And my life and this country's life over that 30 years has actually been pretty good. We can't know what the next 30 years will hold for all of you. Um, I hope it continues to be a time of expanding opportunities, but there's a lot of work to do. And I really hope that all of you will, again, we can't know that any of your particular efforts are gonna make the difference, but there is this notion in, um, from the Jewish tradition, from the Mishnah, that you're not required to finish the work, but nor are you free to turn away from it. You're not responsible for perfecting the world, but you cannot stop working for its perfection. And I think um, that's something I keep with me. We, again, don't know exactly where we're going, um, but we all, I think, have to try to push the world in a slightly better direction. Um, so, we have like a few minutes for questions or comments, feelings about the election, <laughs> homelessness. <laughs> um, of those of you who...
was wondering if you could explain, uh, just because we all have di different levels of knowledge about it, what the Board of Supervisors actually does and like what, what YouTube looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Like, how can we see your work in our lives? Yeah. So, as I, so, Board of Supervisors is like Congress for um, a city. And so we pass laws, um, we pass budgets. There are 11 of us. Uh, we represent uh, different geographic portions of the city. Um, we're elected every four years, but the elections are staggered. If you live, if you live in, do you know, if you live in District 2, raise your hand. District 2 is Pacific Heights, the Marina. If you live in District 4, Raise your hand. District 4 is the Sunset District. If you live in District 6, District 6 is Soma, Tenderloin, not a lot of 6. We've done 8 already. If you live in District 10, raise your hand. 10 is Petrero Hill, Bayview. Okay, so those districts all have elections tomorrow. Um, and, and, uh, so the folks who are elected from those districts represent each of the geographic parts of San Francisco that they're represented from. And as I said, they're kind of like the first line of response for a lot of people if there's a homeless encampment outside their home, or they had a problem on beauty today, or there's a tree that needs to get trimmed outside their house, or um, they're worried about City College and they want the city to do more for City College, or whatever it is, People tend to email or call their supervisor. And then I have three aides. One of them is Aaron Hundy. Hi, Aaron. And we do our best to try to, um, to try to respond to those constituent challenges, to get the city to respond better. Um, and then we try to, you know, to sort of take a step back and look at the larger problems facing the city. So as I said, from my perspective, I think homelessness, mental health, drug addiction issues are super important. So those are things that I have been working on since I got elected. I've been going out and meeting with people who work in nonprofits that serve homeless folks, meeting with city departments that are responsible for trying to address those problems, meeting with the police, the fire department. And then I will be working through the budget and through working with my colleagues on legislation to try to make San Francisco a place that manages homelessness better, or eliminates homelessness, ideally, which is one of the reasons I was so excited to see that Prop C sign out in the lobby. Um, other, you know, other issues affecting the city, transportation. How many of you are frustrated with your Muni experience? All right, well, so that's, that's an issue that we, on the Board of Supervisors, get a lot of calls about, and, that everybody in City Hall has to think about, is there a way that we can make uni work better? Is it a budgetary problem and they need more money? Or is it an administrative problem that we somehow can fix by changing the way uni is administered? And then, some of you may have noticed um, there's a lot of development in the city. People have very different feelings about the kind of development that should happen in San Francisco. And the members of the Board of Supervisors, um, you know, pass, uh, uh, determine what the rules around development are going to be. So those are some of the things supervisors do.
such a proponent that I think in, in uh, she's from Michigan, I think, and in Michigan there's been a tremendous amount of support pushed out of the public school system and over to support uh, to support, support charter schools. Now I actually think there are some charters that do really great work um, and that you can have some kinds of charters um, that can make a positive contribution to the world. But there are certainly powerful economic interests um, that are interested in having a lot more charter schools and, um, and have passed laws that actually make it uh, a requirement for school districts to create resources and, and reallocate resources sometimes away from public, traditional public schools into charter schools. Um, and for me, that's worrying. Um, the, the record of, so although there are some charter schools that do great work, the record on charter schools overall is not a super strong one. Um, and if you are shifting resources away from traditional pu public schools over to charters, I worry a lot about what happens to the folks who have been left in those traditional public schools. for all of you to engage in some way with our politics. And if that, I got my start interning in a city hall office of a supervisor at the time, her name is Doris Ward. Um, for those of you who might be interested in working in city hall, I hope you will reach out, find me or Aaron, um, volunteer on campaigns, I know a lot of you are already doing it, and have a good day.